when we hear about Rwanda and Congo in the news, it's all about genocide, women being raped, wars. And what about this tiny island where I am from, of 250,000 people, that is building an innovative healthcare system and driven by forgotten marginalized people we call pygmies, the native. Nine years ago, my wife, a nurse, and I couldn't stand by while many people were dying from preventable diseases. We couldn't stand by while girls were, have been mar married just to be taken away from the families, families and given to men so that they could be fed. We couldn't stand by. We couldn't just sit in New York and enjoy a good life. We decided to go back. And the best way we thought to change and, and, and bring our, uh, our contribution to this community was by building ecologies, ecotourism. We believe that by building that will provide many jobs to people. We believe that if people had jobs, they will be, they will, they will be able to take care of the families. A few years later, while exploring possibilities and the geographic space where to build those ec ecologies, we stumbled in a native, the Pygmy's village. We just learned that two children have died. And I asked why they died. Sikujua, the oldest of, uh, of women who, by the way, told me that she was invited in 1961 at my mom's wedding, told me, what do you mean? No one will look at us. No one will touch us. I couldn't believe that in 20th century, pygmies were still marginalized, still did, did still exist in the eyes of other people. In fact, pygmies believe they're not humans. And other members of the community believe pygmies are not humans. They're not seen, they're not heard. Then I asked what they thought about this ecology business. One, the eldest said, we love the idea, but what if you built a dispensary for us where we could be, we would be treated like other human beings, like human beings? I was shocked. It became clear to me that it's not what I want. It's not what I thought was good for them. It's what they believe is good for them. They made it clear. The weaker, the powerless big me. I spoke with the communities and we made clear that they were the only people who would have to build their infrastructure. Although they didn't have money, we, we decided that they had to use whatever they had. So with sticks and mud, they built their first clinic. And for the first time, the, those who consider themselves humans and non-humans worked together to build the first clinic. Few years later, after we succeeded, we decreased the cholera rate to zero, the community felt the need to build, to expand the clinic. I believe in a dignifying design. I believe that if we build in the community a beautiful building that inspires the community, that gives them hope and believe in themselves. But we didn't have much land because a powerful landowner around was uh, planted sugarcane. And as some of us know, sugarcane plantation can be a prime bride for mosquito that transmit malaria. So m people who are being uh, treated at the hospital will leave at the, uh, the hospital suffering from malaria. We did everything we could, but the authorities could not take the sugar plantation away. We tried to shut down the clinic until we solved the problem. Then one morning, I was waking up by a group of native pygmies who just said, we just finished the job and the clinic is safe. They are not seen, they are not heard, they, are not, they can't be arrested because they don't exist, they don't pay taxes. So these powerless people who have been looked down, they brought this beautiful idea of building a clinic and they're the one who saved the clinic 
I'm happy to announce that in August we'll open a beautiful 50-bed hospital with solar power, running water, internet connection on one kilometer radius. <laughs> it is this determination, this courage, this belief that they also deserve being part of the community that wakes me up every morning and go work with them. And that's why I do what I do. Thank you.